has emerged as the single most reliable predictor of success and development in the modern world. This is reflected only too well in the Human Development Index, an index developed by the UN to look at quality of life, longevity of life, and education. And if you look at a global map, you very quickly see that the regions which have high levels of human development index are also the regions which have very high levels of literacy. The regions marked in bright colors are those which have low HDI indices and low rates of literacy. There seems to be a rather unequal distribution of the HDI across the world. Sadly, India is one of those countries too. And there are many other developing countries too. To look at this a little further, compare this again with the HDI map of India and the literacy map of India. It is only Kerala which has an HDI index of over 0.95 and a literacy rate of over 90%. Why is it that India has such a big problem with literacy? Okay. We continue to have more than 287 million illiterate adults. It's the highest number in the world, four times the population of France. We still have more than 10 million illiterate children out there. With all the programs that the government is starting out, with the Sarva Shiksha Vigyan, with universal literacy as a motto, why is it that India has not been able to bridge this gap more firmly? Maybe it is time to take a step back and look at the level of literacy and the achievement of universal literacy from a different angle. As a scientist at the National Brain Research Center, we chose to look at this from a more scientific angle and went out into the field to do so. If you look out into the streets of not just India, but also other South Asian economies, you realize literacy and language are rather cultural. Unlike most countries in the West, a country like India requires you to be literate not in one, but multiple languages. And as you will come to see, multiple writing systems. So literacy in a number of South Asian economies is quite complex. You are required to learn to read not just your mother tongue or your native language, but also English. And in other countries, that could also be a third language at play. So let's look at the map of India, and you really imagine and see then, India has 20 officially recognized languages, 11 officially recognized scripts, and two official languages, Hindi and English. And consequently, we have a very complex multiliterate learning environment. Children who go to school have to often learn three languages. It could be the mother tongue or the state language, English and Hindi being the two official languages. And in other cases, it could just be two languages, English and Hindi. But the world knows very little, and so does science, about how to teach children multiple languages, should they be taught sequentially, simultaneously, all at the same time? Nothing much is known about that. So we went out into the field of India to try and ascertain how we were doing it. It was a huge study that was conducted across 2013 and 14, funded by the Department of Science and Technology. We developed for the first time an Indian language assessment battery, which assessed literacy skills, language skills, and fluency skills for starters in four languages. We did Hindi and English, which were the two official languages of India. In addition to get an idea about how state language learning or mother, lang mother tongue learning impacts, looked at Marathi and Kannada also. We collected data from almost 5,000 children across the world, uh, across India, 
and we went to government schools, private schools, municipal schools, Kendra Vidyalas, the works, to try and see what, which were the children sitting in these schools who actually developed good literacy skills. These went on to be incorporated into another battery, which went on to become the Dyslexia Assessment Battery of India, which is for the first time now available to assess children in India the way they should be, in the languages that they speak and the languages that they learn at school. The first learning from this big study was children who had good oral skills, who had good vocabulary, were the ones who achieved good literacy skills. And by literacy now, we are looking at the definition the way it is meant to be. Not just to read and write, but to comprehend, express and communicate. It is not enough for a child to be able to say A, B, C, D. It is important that the child grow up to learn to read a text and understand meaning beyond it. So the underlying concept should be reading for meaning. The second interesting factor, which was very reassuring in many ways, was that children who had good literacy skills in the mother tongue also had good literacy skills in English, not vice versa. So the child who did well in the native language also did well in, in English. This in some ways was very comforting because it meant that the child who had already developed good literacy skills in his mother tongue would still have the opportunity to transfer this learning to the second language. This is something I want you to hold on to because this is something as a country we need to begin to think about very carefully. So the next thing was, as a cognitive neuroscientist, how does the brain learn to read? Language is something that you can learn by immersion, but literacy is learned only by instruction. You have to go to school to get literacy. Not just that, you have to rewire the brain. The, one of the most exciting phenomena in neuroscience is neuroplasticity. The ability of the brain to change. And over the years, we have come to see that neuroplasticity happens across the lifespan. It's not limited to childhood at all. So what was happening during the process of literacy? The sounds of the language were now being mapped to symbols associated with print and then getting meaning out of it. And hence you can understand why it is important for the child to have oral skills. He might learn to map sounds to print and identify the word, even read the word. But if the word has no meaning, there's no motivation to read further. So this is again a concept in reading and literacy that is well known, which we now went on to investigate further in children who were part of the study. So let me tell you a little bit about the human brain. Roughly over a kilo in weight, it has two hemispheres and it has four lobes. The occipital lobe, which is sitting at the back, so sitting at the back of your brain, is the area which is meant for seeing the world. Above your ears are the temporal lobes, these, which are meant for hearing. On top of your head is the parietal lobe, meant for planning and numeracy. But what makes man really man is the frontal lobe. Decision-making, language, executive skills are all happening in the frontal lobe. But what really makes human beings special is the connectivity that develops in the brain. The sizes of our brains are not that much larger than other mammals. But the connectivity that we have in our brains is what makes us very special. And it's the connectivity to this frontal lobe that sets us up for a number of things that we are able to do as human beings. And so, 
we went on to see how the brain learns to read and what might be the underlying networks to do so. So we do this using an MRI scanner. The MRI scanner is a non-invasive way to look inside the brain. It lets you take photographs of your brain and tell you about brain structure. But with advancement in technology, you can also now begin to see which regions of the brain are participating when you do function. And that's what's called functional magnetic resonance imaging. So the colors that you see in red and in blue are regions of the brain that require more oxygen because they are participating in a particular task. And the ratio of this red versus blue tells us which region of the brain is participating in which task. We brought in about 45 children from a school in Gurgaon to participate in this reading study. And here are the kids sitting up there. And it's amazing to see how willing young children are to be part of fun experiments. They are very happy to come back again and again if you just walk them through the science of the experiment actually happening, to let them be part of it. And this is something, too, as a society, I think we need to include more willingly. Okay. It's, it's OK to discuss new ideas and hypotheses with children and to start getting their take on it and to answer some of the curiosities that the young men before us were talking about. And not surprisingly, here's what you find. You find, firstly, that both hemispheres of the brain participate in reading. They participate in reading Hindi and in reading English. If you look carefully, you will also see the networks for reading in Hindi and in English look very similar. Okay? You see regions of the brain meant for seeing. You see regions of the brain meant for hearing, which are along the auditory cortex. And here is the region of the frontal lobe, what many of you might have heard of at some point in time as Broca's area, the region associated for meaning. These were eight to 10-year-old kids who were part of that group of kids who had good oral skills in both Hindi and in English. We also saw evidence of the fact that indeed the brain was forming new connections. And what we now know, not just from our research, but research from other parts of the world too, that literacy transforms the brain. It rewires the brain and sets it up just not to read and write, but to process all kinds of information out there in the world. And so you realize there is really a right to education because you need to wire the brain to be able to absorb all those new rights that are out there in the world to be absorbed. Okay. So coming back to the question that we started out with, mother tongue, other tongue, and another tongue is something that we have out there in the world for our children to do in one kind of school or another. But there is no clear policy on how this is to be introduced in the school. Whether it's simultaneous or sequential, every child has to learn to read two languages. And here's what we realized. Biggest Indian biliteracy problem is the following. Children come to school with oral language in the mother tongue. And then they get print exposure in a different language. So they do not have comprehension or oral skills in the language in which they are getting print exposure. So how is literacy supposed to happen? You can do some level of rote learning, but when is comprehension going to happen? How will motivation to read begin to emerge? So here are two short solutions that we propose. It is up to every parent, teacher, school to take a call on what should be the language of literacy. But it's important to ensure that the child have oral skills in that language. The child have comprehension in that language. And so one easy way seems to be to first provide print exposure in the language in which the child has good oral skills so he can build on them. Because as I showed you a couple of minutes ago, once level of literacy is achieved in the mother tongue, it can be transferred to a second language. 
Remember, we are trying to build identity too when these children are coming to school. We are trying to build thinking minds and we need to empower them with a language in which they can think and communicate, not be held down by it. The second route is, if you have to give a child literacy skills in a different language, before you do so, and I implore you, before you do so, please empower the child with oral skills in that language. Do not be in a hurry to put that child into the print medium to get him to read. First, get him to speak, understand, and comprehend that language, and then expose him to the print. And you will see how the road to literacy will be so much easier. We are trying to implement this program now with a village in Gurgaon, where we have adult learners, a very interesting group of grandmothers between the ages of 40 and 60, who want to learn to read so they can help their grandchildren do homework. They want to do this clearly only in the native language that they have. We are using some of the ideas from our research into this program. And I'm delighted to tell you, these are women who are also coming back to our institute to be part of imaging experiments, to help us understand how the adult brain learns to read. At the end, I'd only like to say, 8th of September is World Literacy Day. Find one individual who does not read or write, who does not have literacy skills. Empower him or her to set out on a road to achieve this literacy. Because you will be empowering him for a life, empower him for a nation, and contribute towards the UN goal of achieving universal literacy by 2020. Thank you.